that I have this really like the coolest job on the planet, and uh, invariably there's somebody in the crowd who's saying like, "Can I have your job?" I imagining working for a company like Google, uh, you guys are probably edging me out on the coolness factor. Uh, so thank you for all that you guys do. Technology has played a big part in the evolving world of beer these days. Everything from uh, apps that allow you to check into beer to uh, websites that uh, review beer to really just keeping breweries in touch with consumers these days. And technology, I think, has really spread the good word of good beer, not only throughout the US, but throughout the world as well. I just came in from New Zealand uh, this afternoon. Uh, I was on an overnight flight. And um, uh, their beer scene down there is growing quite a bit. And it was amazing to me how many people kept um, uh, saying, well, you know, I was reading on the internet about, you know, this particular brewery. Have you been there yet? And there's a lot of enthusiasm. So uh, technology and beer uh, are both very social. So uh, cheers to what you guys do. And uh, thanks for having me here. Um, we have beer on the table. So we're going to do a beer tasting. I'm going to talk about the history of the beer. I don't know why the beers aren't open and you guys aren't already drinking, but let's, um, let's do that first if we can. And uh, I'm going to steal from somebody as we do it. Oh, oh I'm sorry. We're going to start with the can. We're going to start with the Maui Brewing Company, the beer in the can that's in front of you. Uh, that's probably helpful to know as opposed to all of you guys going around and... Uh, Hey, you know, thank you guys. So uh, it, it's very important to know uh, that we do have a limited amount of beer for everybody. So uh, share and share alike be googly in your sharing this, right? Is that a thing? Uh, that's perfect. Uh, about that much or a little bit less for each of the beers in your glass. And this is important for a couple of different reasons. Uh, one, we want the aroma to build uh, in these particular glasses. Um, who's been to a wine tasting before? Who's been to a beer tasting before? Okay, who has not been to a beer tasting before? Okay, so those of you who have not been to a beer tasting before, uh, you're in for a lot of fun. Those of you who've done it before, you already know. Uh, you'll notice right off the bat that there are no dump buckets on the table. That is because you are supposed to drink the beer and you're supposed to enjoy the beer. Uh, if you don't like it, uh, give it to your neighbor and they'll finish it off so that you can uh, fill up the next one. Tasting beer is really one of the most important things about experiencing the beer overall. So uh, let's just do a quick tutorial on how that works overall. So the first thing you want to look at is the appearance. And if you have a little bit of haze on the outside, that's OK. So you want to see what the color of the beer looks like. And what does it make you think of? You know, What does this straw golden yellow uh, liquid in front of you make you think of? And if you give it a little bit of a swirl, you can see the carbonation. You can see that nice fluffy white head uh, appear on top. Uh, beer is just, it's wonderful to look at a lot of the time, but it's more fun to taste. Um, but before we get to that, we're now going to do the aroma of beer. So there's two ways of smelling a beer. Uh, you can do the bloodhound, where you get your nose in, and you do a couple of quick sniffs, and then you can do the drive-by, which I know in LA means something totally different. Uh, and while you're doing that, so much of what we taste, 90% about is, is, is aroma, is aroma driven. So what we perceive as taste is really aroma driven. So while you're smelling your beer, think about food terms. And we're going to talk about that uh, in a little bit. But think about what it is that you're smelling. You know, is it sweet grain? Is it corn? Is it, is it floral? Um, think about the beer in food terms uh, as you go along with this. And then obviously the next thing to do is to taste. Take a, you know, whatever kind of sip you're comfortable with, and then you can take a smaller one. Uh, really kind of see if the aromas that you experience uh, with the beer, and we're going to have a, a range of beers as we go through this today. Um, see if what you're smelling matches what's on your taste bud. See how different tastes, acidity, astringency, uh, sweetness, how all of that appears uh, on your palate once you've actually tasted the beer. And really think about those flavors. Then the next thing is mouthfeel. And wine people know that mouthfeel is very important uh, with, with wine. It's certainly very important with beer. So take a sip, just a small enough sip to, to float your tongue, essentially, and feel the carbonation on your tongue. Is it robust carbonation? Is it uh, you know, super fizzy? Uh, is it light? Is it a little bit more mellow? Uh, and then think about how it coats your tongue. Is it watery? Is it thick? Is it, is it flowing? Is it somewhere in the middle? 
Um, as we go on with, with some of these, and this, is, this particular beer has a little bit of body to it. It's got a little bit more oomph than some of those other lagers that you might see um, out there. And for the color, it's got a little bit more body to it. This is the Maui Bikini Blonde. This comes from Maui in Hawaii. It's a Hellas Lager, and I have to go to my cheat sheet here. It's 5.1% alcohol, um, and this to me is what an American lager should be these days, and the promise that it can have. It's got these really nice bready characteristics to it. It's got a little bit of that floralness to it. It's even got a little bit of like a lemony characteristic uh, in there as well. This, um, I wish I could get this beer in Jersey where I live, but my wife and I spent a week uh, in Maui uh, last year, and I drank this by the case. And it was just, it's a really, really nice, refreshing beer. And we're going to talk a little bit about the history of uh, beer in America, and it's interesting to see that this is where we're at with beer these days, that we do once again have these rich, full, flavorful lagers uh, that dominate, uh, or that are beginning to, to come back into the landscape. Um, we were a country founded by beer. The Mayflower landed at Plymouth Rock uh, because, according to the captain's diaries, their provisions were running low, especially their beer. Uh, they were drinking beer on the way over. It was running low. And so they stopped at Plymouth Rock when they actually meant to go down to Virginia. Um, so from the very start, uh, what we think of like the birth of this country, uh, beer has played an important role. The founding fathers, all of their various uh, farms and plantations and estates, uh, all brewed beer. Uh, a lot of people say that the founding fathers brewed beer themselves. Maybe, but chances are uh, they had the women of the house doing it or they had somebody else doing it. Uh, they were off doing other stuff, and typically the, the men of the house uh, in that era were not necessarily the brewers themselves. Over time, as we became a country of immigrants, more people came over in the 1700s, 1800s. We were getting a lot of people from UK and Germany and, and, and other parts of the world that already had these established brewing countries that had been around for a hundred, you know, hundreds of years. And as they set up in the new cities on the East Coast and then slowly moved west, they, these people who had been brewers back in their own home countries uh, started opening up breweries here. And so we were seeing flavorful lagers, and we were seeing many thousands of breweries operating around the country. And uh, they were bringing their home tradition, uh, their home brewing traditions, to the U.S. shores, using what they could here. This is where corn and rice as uh, uh, added sweeteners and fermentable sugars uh, came into play. Uh, in brewing because that's just simply what was available. Uh, we saw more local breweries back then. We didn't have refrigeration necessarily, and we didn't. Uh, the brewers didn't have the means to make a lot of beer to ship it across the country. So if you lived in uh, uh, New York City, uh, you went to your brewery that was down in the Bowery, or you went to your brewery that was on, uh, you know, the upper parts of town, or Brooklyn, or you drank local. And that's something that our country lost uh, for a while. Because prohibition came into uh, being, as it were. And prohibition was called the, the noble experiment. It failed. From 1920 to 1933, the country was relatively dry. And during that time, a lot of the breweries that were operating closed, which was really uh, devastating to these smaller breweries. When we came out on the other side, we emerged into a, a, a world where larger breweries thrived got bigger, uh, started to expand their distribution network, and eventually uh, became the dominant players uh, throughout the country. Smaller ones died off. And so by the 1970s, we were left with not a great beer culture, only uh, less than 100 breweries, where we once had many thousands of breweries in this country. Um, so we've sort of had this very strange history with beer. Uh, in the U.S. And as people are emptying their glasses, we can start to open up the Keller Weiss from Sierra Nevada. And don't be shy about doing that. I'm going to, uh, this is going to do wonders for my jet lag. Um, oh, yeah, it's okay. You know, if, if we had a little bit of water, we can, we could uh, suss it out. But I'm going to steal a little bit from you as well. Thanks. And that's just a, a really quick, brief history of beer in the U.S. I mean, there's obviously been books and books and books written about this, but since we're here to taste and talk about food, that's just sort of your quick uh, one-two. In the late 1970s, uh, when the brewing culture had really been decimated, 
we got to this, um, uh, this, this point where it could have gone one of two ways. And fortunately, it went the good way. And it started with a guy named Jack McAuliffe. Uh, in Sonoma, in the late 1970s, a former naval engineer who started home brewing back when he was in the Navy and stationed overseas, uh, decided to fabricate some equipment out of some uh, old stainless dairy tanks and opened up and got a license for a brewery in Sonoma. And he called it New Albion, and it made only a few barrels of beer at a time uh, compared with you know, tens of millions being produced by uh, the larger players on the scene. Um, by most accounts, the beer needed some work, but the important thing was that it was different and it was small, and it gave people an opportunity to realize that beer didn't have to just come from one factory in the, uh, you know, uh, many different factories with the same label uh, throughout the country. And so Jack up in Sonoma started getting a lot of attention. He got a spread in the New York Times, he got a spread in the Washington Post. People started coming from around the country to see what he was doing. University of California up in Berkeley, which already had a professional brewing school where most of the students who went through that were destined for careers at Anheuser-Busch or Miller Brewing Company or Coors Brewing Company, started taking field trips to Jack's place and seeing that you could fabricate small equipment and make flavorful ales and lagers on your own terms and not just follow um, what had become mass-produced uh, uh, beer. One of the people who came and visited owned a homebrew supply shop and a bicycle repair shop in Chico, California. And he came down and he saw what Jack was doing. And this guy had a particular engineering mind and looked around and goes, you know, I, I, I could do this. And so the guy's name is Ken Grossman. And he went back up to Chico. And then he co-founded the Sierra Nevada Brewing Company, which is what we're drinking right now. We're drinking their Keller Weiss, uh, which is a German-style wheat beer that is, going to my cheat sheet again, 4.8% alcohol. It is brewed with wheat, uh, along with malted barley, so you're gonna get a little bit of that lemony flavor, a little bit of that tart flavor. And then as you swirl it around, it uses this really distinctive yeast um, that gives off a particular flavor and a particular aroma. Is anybody, is anybody picking up on what the dominant aroma is? Getting some citrus. Little aren't, yep. Banana, that's it. And now that we've said that, is everybody else picking up the banana now? Yeah. It, beer is very suggestive. I could have said, oh, you know, it's chocolate covered cherries. And people would say, oh, yeah, no, I can get that as well. I love screwing around with people like that. I, I like you guys too much, so I'm not going to do that, but uh, yet. Um, but yeah, a banana, a little bit of clove in there as well. Um, it's a really nice, refreshing beer. Um, and Sierra Nevada is now the second largest craft brewery in America. Uh, they just celebrated 34 years. 30, they're almost 35 now. And uh, they're, they're producing just about a million barrels of beer a year. They're going to grow in the years to come. Uh, Jack McCall started with about seven barrels of beer a year. Uh, if memory served, in, his, in the five years that he lasted, the best year that he had, he produced somewhere around 400 barrels. Uh, it's 31 and a half gallons in a barrel, uh, just for scale of size. So Jack did four, four, 400 and change uh, barrels. Sierra Nevada, which was inspired by Jack McAuliffe, is now doing well over a million, and they're going to continue to grow uh, with a new facility as well. So Jack only lasted five years, and uh, the historian Maureen Ogle, who wrote a great book about the history of beer, called Jack's Brewery the most successful failed brewery in America, because he really did inspire uh, so much of what's going on today. So if you still have beer in your glass, I always like to just do a quick toast to Jack to thanking him for where we are these days. Does anybody have any questions while we're just getting started? It, it's the yeast. So, um, you know, we should talk about that a little bit of, um, there's four main ingredients in beer. And it's water, it's malt, it's hops, and it's yeast. And each of those particular beers have their own food flavors to them. Uh, and that's really where um, uh, the beer industry is right now, is thinking about beer as food. Beer is food. But it's so difficult sometimes to get that message across for some of the brewers because they're, you know, they're talking about, you know, 
well, this is malty or this is hoppy or, you know, boy, it's got these great yeast uh, esters to them. And we're not necessarily thinking about, hey, there's some seats in the front, guys. Um, we're not necessarily thinking, or they're not necessarily thinking about beer as food terms. So um, that's one of the things that is probably important to talk about. Um, and then if you guys want to start pouring the stout, you're more than welcome to if you've gotten to that point. If you haven't, don't feel rushed. This is, this is not a marathon. This is a, this is a fun beer tasting. This is social. It happens every time. It's, uh, but I'm terribly sorry, sir, you're cut off. All right, so uh, beer as food. Four main ingredients of beer, water, malt, hops, and yeast. Each of those four main ingredients have their own food flavors and components on their own. And so it's, it's kind of fun to break it out a little bit. So you have water, which can have a mineral or a sulfur content to it. Uh, there's malt, and depending on how the malt is kilned, which means uh, roasted essentially, it starts off as very pale, and it can have a biscuity or grape nutty or cereal grain kind of taste to it. And the more you kiln it and the more you roast it, uh, the more you, uh, the darker it gets and the more flavors it takes on. So it, you toast it a little bit, and then it takes on notes of caramel. Uh, and then you roast it some more, and you start to get uh, chocolate, uh, um, just chocolate and coffee and toffee. And then you can go really uh, 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 deep with it and it can turn even like acrid black and uh, ash even. Uh, you can smoke the malt so that you get a smoky flavor uh, from it as well. And you just actually just put the kiln malt over a, a, a flame with a smoke and it infuses those flavors. And then when you brew with it, it takes on those flavors as well. So sometimes you get some peat smoked malt and some other cherry wood smoked malt and all different kinds of smoked malts, and it takes it on there as well. But these are all flavors to think about with, the, um, with, with, with malt itself. And I'm getting distracted because I want to go grab another beer if I can. Thank you, sir. You're a wonderful assistant. I appreciate it. It's, uh... <laughs> well, it shows. Your skills are impeccable. Um, so we'll talk about the other two in a second, but this is a very uh, malt-forward beer now that we're pouring. This is the Otis from Ninkasi, and I looked this up uh, just a few minutes ago, and this is about 7.2%. They make this out of Eugene, Oregon. Um, I love this, uh, pairing this in a beer float with a scoop of vanilla ice cream, or it goes well with a really hearty lamb stew uh, as well. When you smell this, and you, you kind of do that, that, that whole aroma thing uh, with the beer, and I'll try not to do that again, um, what are some of the flavors uh, or aromas that you're getting off of this? Coffee, chocolate, those are the two uh, big ones. And then when you taste it, are those flavors coming through as well? Yeah. What's really interesting is that there is neither coffee nor chocolate in this beer. It all comes from, from the roasted malt. Um, they use a variety of different malts in there, including a malt that is called chocolate malt. And when you get some of that and you, you eat it raw, uh, it does taste like a piece of uh, bitter chocolate or can uh, or various types of chocolate. So um, now that's always kind of fun because people will swear, no, there's definitely coffee or chocolate in there. There's, there's not. And that just shows just how diverse uh, malt can be depending on, on how it's kilned and, and how it's roasted. So um, this is a big kind of, um, on the mouthfeel of this, it's very creamy. Uh, it's very, uh, there's oatmeal in this as well, uh, flaked oats uh, in this beer as well. So you're going to get a little bit of that chewy, a little bit of that creamy uh, mouthfeel off of this. This is, um, uh, people think about Guinness as a, as a big, dark, heavy beer. Um, try the mouthfeel trick next time you're out. With, uh, with Guinness. And you're going to notice that it's actually fairly watery. It doesn't have a lot of body to it. It's that nitrogen pour uh, off of the bar that gives it a creamy sort of um, uh, texture. But the beer itself uh, is very watery. This is very, this is robust. This is sticks to your ribs, uh, like I say, lamb stew or you know, one of those cold winter nights that LA is famous for. Um, you know, if I chilled this down, and you know, proper beer serving temperature is usually in the cellar temperature range, so about 50 or so degrees. Um, but I, I admit that sometimes in the summer I will chill down one of these to like that ice bucket cold, mountain stern blue kind of pull it out of the uh, pull it out of the cooler and and drink it ice cold on the on a hot day. 
and it's super refreshing. It's almost like drinking an iced coffee, except it's got you know, the other kind of benefits aside from caffeine. So, so the next ingredient is hops. And I, when people say to me, oh, I don't like beer, um, I ask them why. And some people will say, oh, I don't like the taste of it, or it's too bitter, um, or it's just not for me. And, and the bitterness stands out because that's what hops give beer. Not only aroma, but they also give bitterness. And bitter is a terrible word. Uh, you know, bitter is sort of like when you have a kid brother and you're eating something uh, as children that you don't like, and you're like, oh, this is awful. Here, try this. Um, it, it, you immediately have this connotation of like, oh, I'm not going to enjoy this so when you say bitter. And so one of the things that I like to, to, to say with people, and again, if, we, uh, if, if people are ready to move on to the next one, that's fine. We can, we can talk about it uh, again. Um, hops can have flavors and aromas of everything from uh, citrus, like tangerine and orange and lemon and lime leaf, um, to tropical fruits like pineapple or guava or mango. Uh, there's other hops that have resin or pine aromas to them. Uh, there's still new ones that have uh, peach or blueberry aromas coming off of them. Uh, and it, where I was in New Zealand just recently, they have their hops and they're breeding them and they're growing them. Uh, and they have these aromas of gasoline you know, when, you know when you pump gas and then you, you get back in the car and about 20 minutes later you kind of smell your hand, it's that faint smell of petrol? That's what's appearing in these hops these days. And they love it for some reason. Um, and, and, and there's also like a smell of, of, of what I was calling sweat socks and they were calling laundry. Um, and, 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 and they're putting this in their beer. But again, when you know what it is that you're smelling and you know that the brewers want it in there intentionally, uh, it doesn't, it, it, it's not quite as unappealing uh, as, as it might sound. So um, when we move on to the next beer, which is going to be the Ale Smith IPA, um, think about some of those aromas that I just talked about. See if any of those present uh, in your mind uh, as you're tasting it. And then recognize that at the end, when you get a little bit of that, that, that bite, that pucker, that, that, that bitterness uh, on the end that'll be at a, you know, in the back of your tongue kind of thing. Um, think about the flavors that you smelled first. Uh, and then suddenly bitterness becomes a lot more approachable um, in beer, um, especially with IPAs, which is a really decisive uh, thing for people. We, we're, it's the most entered category, the India Pale Ales, uh, in the, uh, the Great American Beer Festival every year. Uh, it is the beer style that is leading this craft beer charge uh, that we're in these days. And unfortunately, like I say, there, there hasn't been great education to the general public on experience the overall flavors and aromas of an IPA. But if you think about it from the pine notes or the, or the fruit notes um, or even the gasoline notes, uh, you're going to come around a little bit more and hopefully enjoy uh, those overall flavors. Yes? Why do I think IPAs are more popular in the craft? Because they're big and bold and unapologetic and in your face, and that is America. Um, uh, you know, I, I, it, it's interesting. Um, there's a couple of different theories on this, and I'm sort of of the mindset of, for a long time in the US when we had these generic lagers that were out there that are technically perfectly made. Just, they just don't have a lot of flavor that appeals to uh, a, a lot of new beer drinkers these days. Um, the IPAs is a run in a different direction. One, it's an ale, not a lager. Um, but two, it, it's just so jam-packed with, with, with flavor, with extra booze. With, it, it's, just, it's the polar opposite, and that's what the brewers wanted. They wanted to say, yeah, you all knew these guys over here. This is us over here. This is flavor country, uh, as it were. And I think that that's one of the reasons that it's led the charge. Um, Interestingly enough, we are seeing a change in the overall beer market these days. Uh, people are tending towards sessionable beers or more well-balanced beers uh, these days where you can actually taste all four ingredients uh, in the beer and not just a dominant hop, um, which, which is really quite great. And it shows the, the overall maturity of the market right now. But I think it was really just running in the opposite direction of where we had been and uh, where beer really took off uh, up on... In Northern California and uh, Oregon and Washington, they're already growing hops up there to begin with. And so hops became a, a fairly dominant flavor in there. So um, have people started opening up the IPA? 
What are some of the aromas that you're getting off of that? Orange? Mango, pine? Grapefruit. <laughs> Freedom. <laughs> Smells like bald eagles and monster truck rallies. Um, I'd love to get this at a monster truck rally. Um, but when you taste it, though, the malt characteristic really comes through on this as well. You get a little bit of like that biscuity uh, cereal grain, a uh, little bit of caramelization in there as well. You'll also notice that when you hold it on your tongue and do mouthfeel, um, it's going to be a bit more chewy. It's going to be a bit more thick. Uh, again, you know, people will say, oh, I don't like uh, uh, dark beers. They're too heavy. And they might tend towards this because it's this nice sort of like burnt orange amber. Uh, this is actually heavier than a lot of those uh, commercial stouts that are out there. And you can kind of feel that. And you can also see that as well with the lacing on the glass of just uh, uh, how robust this particular beer is. So we've talked about water. We've talked about malt. We've talked about hops. There's an old saying that uh, brewers make wort, which is a sweet liquid, uh, sugary liquid, but yeast makes the beer. And so when you add yeast to sweet wort, uh, it eats the sugars and creates alcohol and CO2, carbonization. And without yeast, we would not have beer. So uh, be thankful for that little microbe. Um, the flavors of yeast, which are so diverse, can be everything from, and we've already seen this, from banana and bubble gum. Uh, there's uh, pepper. Uh, there is uh, flowers. Uh, there, there's honey. Uh, there's bubble gum. Uh, is, a, is a great uh, yeast flavor as well. Um, it's really quite diverse, uh, the, the various yeast flavors out there. And uh, different styles of beer use different styles of yeast. So Belgian beers uh, will have a lot of very fruity ester beers, uh, fruity ester yeast that can have uh, stone fruits and plums and um, really great depths, like honey kind of thing. And then, you know, you'll have some others, uh, like we said, you know, some of these German beers that can have, you know, banana or clove or just can be very crisp and clean. Uh, as well, where it does let the other flavors um, come through. Um, the Keller Weiss is really the best example of a yeast forward beer that we have up here uh, right now. And again, that, that's, um, if, if you go onto YouTube at some point, Sierra Nevada uh, does another beer. And this is an open fermented beer, which essentially means that uh, they pour the, uh, the sweet wort into these large uh, tanks, which look like bathtubs that are essentially the size of this stage here uh, and much, much taller. And they fill it with the sweet wort, and then they add the, uh, the yeast to it. And it open ferments, and it bubbles and blows over. And it's, it's a really fun thing to watch. Um, Sierra Nevada has a video where they do their Bigfoot barley wine every year in the same open fermenters. Uh, and if you, you, you YouTube it or you Google it, um, you can see this very cool minute-long video of just this yeast kind of exploding off of the, uh, uh, these open bathtub uh, fermenters. Uh, most of the beer is done. Uh, most normal beer, or not normal, that's a terrible word. Um, uh, these other beers are probably done in closed fermentation uh, tanks and where the, the yeast can blow off if it needs to. But if you're looking for a fun visual, that's a cool video to look up. Um, I probably should have shown it, but that's uh, poor planning on my part. Um, overall thoughts on the IPA? I should say that this is the Alesmith IPA uh, down in San Diego, 7.25%. Um, with food, I would go with spicy Thai would go really well with this. Uh, blue cheese would go really well with this. Uh, and also carrot cake would go exceptionally well with this. And that kind of brings us to how beer pairs with food. So for uh, after Jack McAuliffe uh, came and left, and uh, the new breweries like Sierra Nevada opened up. Uh, we had a, a fun couple years of what was called microbrew. And it got a lot of attention. It was these small brewers that were doing various, um, uh, various beers. Unfortunately, not all of them were doing a good job. And what we found was that um, uh, they closed over time. They were taking, they, they had these beers that were, uh, they were taking an animal name and they were taking a bodily fluid and mixing it together. So you were getting like beaver spit or, you know, monkey piss or something terrible. And people would go and buy these six packs and bring it to parties as a joke, uh, being like, hey, look what I saw on the shelf. Isn't this crazy? 
And um, you know, your friends would look at you kind of like, jackass. And, um, and when you tasted the beer, it, it tasted like, you know, uh, beaver sweat. And so um, a, a lot of these businesses went out and I uh, went out of business. And the ones that survived uh, grew and became better at what they were doing. They really focused on quality. They really focused on flavor. It wasn't just a fed for them. This was a long-term business and an industry that they wanted to grow of these microbreweries. Uh, the name was essentially rebranded to craft beer to kind of get away from the bad connotations of microbrew. And once that really took off, uh, you start to see it everywhere now, which is a really great thing. Uh, from Jack McAuliffe uh, being the first craft brewer in the late 1970s, we now have 3,000 plus breweries operating in the country with another 1,000 planning to come online within the next couple of years. It's grown tremendously. And all of these, or most of them I should say, are really focused on quality and they're focused on their local area. With so many people now knowing about craft beer, there's now an attention being paid to pairing good beer with good food. And that's where the cookbook comes into play. Uh, I spent two and a half years working on the American Craft Beer Cookbook, uh, pulling recipes from around the country, from breweries that I know, breweries that I respect, beer bars that I know and respect, uh, and even a few from my own kitchen. And what I really wanted to do was highlight the diversity of beer. And so you hear a lot of people say, oh, you know, uh, when it comes to, to, to uh, alcoholic beverages and, and, and food pairings, uh, red meat goes with red wine and white wine goes with chicken and fish. It's not that black and white as any real wine lover will tell you. Um, it's certainly not easy to paint a picture like that with beer. So we've already talked about the great diversity uh, with these flavors of these beers that we've had so far. Uh, and I'm going to just ask you guys to hold off on opening up that last one before we um, uh, go any further. You can finish off some of these others that we have. Um, you know, leave no man behind. Uh, leave, leave no beer in the bottles, as it were. Um, when it comes to pairing beer with food, um, we can't just think about our protein, like, 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 like that wine saying goes. We really need to think about how uh, the food is prepared, what it's being served with, what's being served on top of it. And so an example that I like to use quite a bit when it comes to thinking about beer and food is a steak. And so you go to a nice steakhouse and invariably somebody's going to offer you a glass of red wine. But why does red wine work? And for a number of reasons, it's, it's a bold flavor that can stand up to bold flavor. Uh, for other reasons, it just looks good uh, on, uh, on the plate and the glass and on the, on the, on the, on the plate as well. With beer, it's fun to think about the steak and how it's prepared. And so you throw a steak on the grill and you're gonna get that caramelization of the fat, a little bit of that black char on the outside of it. And then when you cut into the steak, you're gonna get these savory juices in there as well and that meatiness of, of the overall uh, piece of steak. And if there's vegetarians in the crowd, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm gonna stick with this meat motif. Um, and so I think about a brown ale or a porter, or even a stout when I start thinking of a steak on the grill. And that's because of the malts that we talked about before, which have some of those caramel notes to them, maybe a little bit of that, that black acridness uh, to it um, that will complement those existing flavors on the outside char and outside crust of the steak. And then when you cut it open and you get those savory, uh, those savory juices, the sweetness of the beer is going to contrast uh, the meat itself and bring out a whole new dimensions of flavors as well. But then you say, all right, so a brown ale uh, goes with a steak. Not always. Because what happens if you put like a gorgonzola sauce or a blue cheese sauce on top of that steak? Now that's really going to become the dominant flavor and you're going to need something that can stand up to that. And that's where something like an IPA comes in because it can stand up to those blue cheese flavors, kind of cut through some of that, that, that fat and really bring out some roundedness and some of those other flavors as well. So you can't just think about your protein, you have to think about what it's served with, uh, what's, what it's being served alongside with as well. Um, and as you drink more beer and you think about beer as food with going through those flavors that we talked about um, earlier, it's gonna become easier and easier to pair good beer with good food. The other thing that's important to, to, to mention is that it's not just the four main ingredients in beer these days, but brewers, uh, especially in the US, are fearless and sometimes foolhardy 
that they will brew with just about anything. So these days, you will actually get chocolate in your beer, and you'll get coffee in your beer, and you'll get tea in your beer, and then you'll have all sorts of manners of exotic fruits in your beer, uh, not just ones that you find at the grocery store, but ones that they are traveling to Africa to source, uh, things that a lot of us have never heard of here in the States. They're finding vegetables to brew with. There was one particular brewer a couple of years ago that brewed a beer with grilled beef hearts. It was not good. Uh, you know when you walk into a butcher shop and you get that like tinny blood metallic uh, scent in the air? Yeah, you would open up a bottle over there and it would just kind of waft around the room. Um, it had a very short shelf life, thankfully. Um, and it, 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 I don't think they make it anymore, which is, which, is, which is quite good. But it shows you know, that brewers are really trying to bring different things into beer. Um, uh, I, I try to find beers that are brewed with honey and I pair it with ham a lot of the time. Uh, just the thought being honey-baked ham is such a great combination uh, that why can't it work? Um, to that point on the ham thing, there are beers being brewed with bacon that are actually really quite nice. It's like a breakfast beer uh, in a lot of ways, especially if they've added some coffee in there as well. Um, you know, so th there's a lot going on. Um, and, and the only thing that limits brewers these days is their own imagination and their own creativity. So it's an awesome time to be a beer drinker in the U.S. right now. Um, so I just challenge you to think about that with beer and food next time you're out of, you know, don't necessarily reach for, for a glass of wine instinctively, but really think about what it is that you're going to eat and think about why you're having a glass of wine or a glass of beer uh, along with it and try to find something that is as good in the glass uh, that is as good on your plate and see if you can't meld them together. Um, and that's something that's really important. And I'm not anti-wine. I just want to point that out. A lot of people are like, oh, you're against the grape. Uh, I'm, I'm really not. Um, I drink a lot of wine. I drink a lot of spirits. I drink a lot. Um, <laughs> you guys laugh. Every time I do that joke, my wife is rolling her eyes. and just um, It's not true. Um, <laughs> it's a little bit true. Um, the last thing that I'll mention um, is cooking with beer as well. As you're flipping through the cookbook, you'll see that a lot of the recipes in there uh, use beer as an ingredient. Uh, not only is beer fun to pair with, beer is fun to cook with. And adding a beer is, uh, to a dish is like adding a spice cabinet. Because once you degas the beer, once you heat it up, once you've added garlic to anything, it's not going to taste the way that it does in our glass. It's going to taste totally different. And so you're going to get uh, deeper flavors. Um, from it. it can be like using a stock. Uh, beer is great in salad dressings. It's great as a marinade. Not only does it add uh, some tenderness to, um, uh, to the meat uh, or to your protein by having the carbonation nibble away at it a little bit, uh, but it also can add some additional sweetness uh, that can bring out some of the more savory flavors uh, as well. Don't just cook with beer for the sake of cooking with beer. Uh, as I was researching this book, uh, there's been a lot of beer cookbooks uh, in the past, and one thing that I wanted to avoid was uh, people said, well, you know, add a tablespoon of lager and then move on. That does nothing uh, to, to, to the overall. If you're going to cook with beer, cook with beer. Uh, one of the recipes in there uses an entire six-pack of a scotch ale in there, which I know people are like, well, why would you use an entire six-pack? Because it's good when it comes out on the other end, and that's why. Uh, because anything less than six or anything more than six just wouldn't have done. Um, so... Th Cooking with beer can be a lot of fun, but not if you're just going to do it for the sake of doing it. Um, the cookbook itself, as you can see, has 155. It's actually 157, but that didn't have the same ring for the cover. Uh, breakfast to dessert. People say, why breakfast? I say, Frank Sinatra used to say, you can't drink all day unless you start in the morning. <sighs> there are a lot of vegetarian options. I know I spent a lot of time talking about meat. Uh, today, but there are vegetarian and gluten-free options in there. Uh, I think that's important. Uh, we've moved beyond the days of a burger and bud and uh, pork nachos and beer and all sorts of things. There are a really, there's a lot of great diversity that comes with food these days, and there's a lot of great diversity that comes with, uh, with beer these days. And really quickly, I'll just say that it's been fun to watch the way that the two worlds, the food world and the beer world, have evolved together in the last few years. So we talked about prohibition and after prohibition, how we all kind of became these 
uh, generic, oh yeah, uh, you know, these you know, generic beers that were out there, these, these lagers. Our food culture kind of went the same way as well. You know, our, our grandparents, our great-grandparents, uh, they all knew where dinner came from every night. And so uh, it, you'd have fresh baked bread on the table. Your meat came from the local butcher. Your vegetables came from the green grocer or from the backyard. And, and you knew what it was that you were putting into your body. And, but slowly over time, uh, that changed and we became this culture of convenience and mass produced. And so real cheese became Velveeta and fresh baked bread became Wonder Bread. And rather than working on a dinner, uh, even if it would only take an hour at the end of the night, we convinced ourselves that we were so busy that we'd pop a plastic tray into the microwave and whatever came out two minutes later, we'd, we'd call that dinner. We've moved on. I mean, the, we still have a lot of that in the country, but we're starting to, to see more and more that people care about where their food is coming from. They want to know who's making their food. The locavore movement is coming back into play. Farmers markets haven't been this popular in ages. People really care about what they're putting in their bodies. And the same thing is true for the brewing industry. Uh, you can walk into your local brewers around here, and you guys have quite a few here in the LA area, uh, and more and more it seems all the time, and you can meet the people who make your beer. You can shake the hand of the guy or, or woman who, who made what is now in your glass. And that's a personal connection as well. It's like knowing where your vegetables came from. And so to see the craft beer movement and the locavore movement kind of come together uh, has really been great for the beer and food movement uh, and, and, and books like this. So that's just another thing to think about. When you're, when you're buying craft beer, you're supporting smaller businesses, you're supporting local, uh, and you're doing your part to... Uh, do right by yourself by by getting some good flavorful uh, beer into your system. Uh, there's a question over here. In regards to cooking, how do the four different ingredients, probably most, mostly the, the hops and the yeast, those flavors, how do they stand up to cooking and what do you lose? Um, it, 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 so, so the question is, how does the four main ingredients uh, stand up when you're cooking with beer? It really depends on the beer. Um, I, I tend to find that more malt-forward beers uh, work a little bit better than more hop forward beers when it comes to uh, cooking. Um, the hops can take on some astringency and some not nice flavors if you're gonna be boiling it for a long time. Um, whereas uh, malt, more malt forward beers, I think go a lot further just because of the, the sweetness uh, that, it, that it brings to, to, the, to the game. But it really depends on the overall beer uh, that, that you're cooking with. Um, I, I try to be as specific as possible in the book as saying like, you know, if you're gonna cook with this beer, here's why you should and here's some of the flavors that come out with it. Um, and it was a lot of fun trial and error to try to come up with that while, while I was doing that. So um, uh, we, we can get into the general question portion of things now, and with that, opening up the last beer. So IPAs have been leading the charge in the US for a while, and I keep hearing you know, from people like, oh, our sour is going to be the next, uh, the next IPA. Um, I don't know if they are, but this is going to be a sour blonde from the Almanac Brewing Company up in the San Francisco area. Uh, it's tart. It is brewed with two types of cherry, a Rainier cherry, and I'm so hesitant to use this, the name of the variety of cherry that they use here. It's called Bing. Um, I... <laughs> I was, reading, I was reading the description before, and I was like, oh, man, I'm bringing like a Bing to Google. That's so weird. Um, and this has been aged in wine barrels as well. Uh, there's a lot going on with this beer. It's 7%. Uh, uses three types of yeast in here, including uh, famous San Francisco sourdough yeast culture in there. So um, as you're doing your aromas and your flavors and everything in between, um, you're going to be getting a lot of different, a lot of things. So I'm going to come down and join you, if I may. Thank you so much. What's that? Right. Are there, are there, are there Google cherries? If not, get on it. Um, so that's kind of where we're at very quickly with beer and food these days and the history of beer and how we got to sitting in a room uh, drinking a wide range of diverse beers from a wide range of mostly West Coast breweries. And uh, yeah, any thoughts, any questions? What, I'll go back there and then, yes. If possible, can you use the microphone? Just 
for yeah. the sake of the YouTube. Yes. This is going this is going on the YouTube. So if you could use the microphone. So you talked about all these wonderful food pairings. I mean, some of us, I think we're getting actively hungry in the back there. And I'm wondering, in addition to these like speaking tours, if you consider doing sort of an event where we come in and we try some of the, boot, the beer, some of the food together, your spiel on you know the yes. steak, now with the gorgonzola, now yes. without. Yes. How soon do you want me to come back and do that? Um, Saturday? Sure. That's, that'd be good for me. Absolutely. <laughs> I will absolutely, yeah, I, I do that quite a bit. Um, oh, we do beer awesome. dinners and beer tastings, and that's a fun thing. Um, scan, you know, I, 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 and I love doing it, but um, they're happening all over the country these days. You know, uh, sign up when you go and visit your local brewery and sign up for their newsletters, um, and they will send you uh, different things that they're doing. And you'll really find uh, beer dinners that they're doing and uh, beer and cheese pairings that they're doing. Boy, you're really having a tough time with this microphone, man. That is, I am, yes. <laughs> you were cut off Hello. at this point. You're now the second person to get cut off. Um, the, the cool thing, and one of the things that I didn't really touch about with this book is um, beer is local, but so is food. And so when you look through this book, you're going to find seafood dishes that come from New England and, and, and the Pacific Northwest. And you're going to find spicy dishes that come from the Southwest. And you're going to find meat and dairy dishes that come from the heartland. Or you're going to find uh, very city-specific uh, food traditions as well. And the book kind of overall tells the story of where we are with beer and food and how both can be local and how both can play with local uh, strength. So I love doing beer dinners, uh, and especially when I travel around because I get to talk with chefs and brewers and be like, okay, you know, here in LA, there's a great um, uh, food truck culture that exists, right? And there's, you know, really great Mexican that exists. Let's find these local food traditions and find local beers that bring out the best flavors in both. And that's really uh, the cool thing. So the point that I was trying to make is, uh, find your local brewers, find good local beer bars around here, and see if they're doing beer dinners, and go and just sit and taste. It's a lot of fun uh, to do, and it's, you know, it's fun to, to get out with friends as well, and it's something different to do as well. Um, awesome date nights. Uh, it's, it's all sorts of very cool. Uh, there's, there's very cool stuff that's happening. But yeah, uh, anytime you guys want me to come back and, and do a beer dinner, yeah, I'm, I'm on the next plane from Jersey. So, Yes. Yes, sir. So uh, you First mentioned... First time's a charm. I like that. It's... <laughs> I am mic enabled, yes. Um, so when you were mentioning uh, the pairing with a steak, you mentioned you add some blue cheese. You add either a porter or perhaps a stout. What is the modern difference between those? Oh, God, I hate that question. I know. Um, very little. That's what I thought. Very like, little. I was always just kind of yeah, assuming it's, a stout it, was an it's, imperial It's porter. evolved over time when you look at the overall definitions um, uh, when judging is done, it can be tough to tell the difference between the two. Uh, right, because there's even a, different categories. Of exactly, GDI. it's different <laughs> categories. Uh, you know, some people make the argument that it's you know Irish versus uh, uh, United Kingdom kind of difference. Uh, you know, Guinness versus you know London London Porter kind of thing. Um, yeah, there's not there's not a, a heck of a lot of difference uh, on its face uh, of them. Um, when you start to get into some of the the larger or the more boozy uh, complex uh, stouts and porters, uh, the differences become more vast. The difference between like a foreign extra stout and a Baltic porter uh, are, are a little bit different. But um, yeah, it's I hate that question because I, 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 I get it all the time and I've never come up with like a really good answer that people walk no away being answer. like, you're a genius. <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah. So uh, much easier uh, personal preference question. So obviously at, you get asked every day, what's your favorite beer? But mm -hmm. within your favorite style, if you have one, what is your preferred, your favorite beer that you've ever tasted? Favorite beer that I've ever tasted? Shit, that's a tough question. Assuming you don't have a favorite that you've never tasted. <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> there are known knowns and there are known unknowns and unknown unknowns. Um, I, I tend towards stouts and porters myself. Uh, it, it, it's really sort of my, my go-to style uh, if I'm out. Um, but it really depends on where I'm at, who I'm with, the what's local, what, what tastes good. Um, for the purposes of when I do beer tastings at home and judging, I keep uh, Sam Adams Boston Lager and Sierra Nevada Pale Ale in my fridge. Um, and that's because I know exactly how those beers taste like. Um, so they're not my go-tos, but I'm very familiar with them. 
and that helps when I'm tasting new beers because if I feel like I'm tasting something that's an off flavor or I'm feeling like I'm just having a bad tasting day, I can open up one of those and if it tastes how I know it's supposed to taste, then I know that there's something wrong with this beer that I'm tasting. If those beers don't taste right to me, it means that I had something weird for lunch and it's throwing me off a little bit. Um, there's a couple of beers throughout the country, and, and I hate playing favorites, you know, because I you know, run this beer magazine where we're impartial, but, um, you know, there's a couple of beers that I do try to seek out whenever I'm traveling. Uh, New Glarus out in Wisconsin makes a beer called Raspberry Tart, which is just phenomenal. It's about 4% alcohol, made with fresh raspberries. Uh, it's got this, like, a brown ale with raspberries. It's just delightful. Um, the Cambridge Brewing Company out in Massachusetts does a summer barley wine that they call Archivist. That's about 14% alcohol. Uh, that's got these like really wonderful boozy vanilla flavors, and they only put it out once a year, and it seems like I'm on a train from New York up to Boston uh, every summer just to, to taste this particular beer. Um, but, you know, it, it, for me these days, there's so many cool beers to be tasting out there that, um, you know, I haven't found my next favorite yet, and I haven't found the next one that's going to stop me dead in my tracks uh, and make me say, wow, and that's, that's kind of a cool thing is it just shows how much the brewers are pushing the envelope these days and really continually trying to make themselves better. So um, it's always a lot of fun when I smell a beer for the first time, like I did with this one, and I get this big smile on my face because I know as soon as I smell it that I'm really going to enjoy this beer. Uh, and that's a cool thing for me because that still happens quite a bit. And you'd think with 3,000 breweries in the country that it wouldn't happen quite so much, but it is. Okay, I'm really so digging the cherries off of this, by the way. This is. So you mentioned beef hearts. So yes. Ig ignoring that, what are your, what's your favorite gimmick ingredient and your least favorite gimmick ingredient that you've tried thus far? Beef hearts is my least favorite. Besides beef hearts. Be besides beef hearts. Um, probably my favorite is coffee. Um, I think coffee just brings so much to stouts. And there's brewers that are trying different things these days with coffee. Uh, we have a brewery in New Jersey called Carton, which did a coffee light and sweet. So that's sort of an East Coast thing. I don't know if it's out here, but it's basically like three sugars and milk in your coffee. And so it's, uh, it's like coffee for kids, essentially. And they did a beer that was maybe about this color thereabouts, but it had a good ton of coffee in it. And when you think of a coffee beer, you're not necessarily thinking of a light colored beer uh, as well. And so um, I really dig that because they use some lactose sugar, which is milk sugar, and, uh, and the, the coffee in it. So it actually tasted like a, like a coffee light and sweet, which was, which was kind of fun. Um, you know, coffee is also great with IPAs. Uh, Stone Brewing Company a couple years ago did a uh, collaboration, uh, Dayman Coffee, where it was uh, these bright floral hoppy notes uh, with this really nice kick of coffee and again, uh, lighter color. Um, my magazine did a collaboration with Sierra Nevada Brewing a couple months ago where we also did a coffee IPA uh, with Counterculture Coffee, which is a, a growing chain and a growing business. And we um, uh, tried different coffee varieties where you know we wanted ones that had you know berry and lemon notes to it and then we found hops to match so that it brought out uh, those additional flavors. So I'm really digging what's happening with coffee these days. Um, as I've been rambling on that, I've been really trying to think about some of the bad stuff that I've had. Um, there's a lot of brewers that are using rare and exotic fruits these days. Um, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. The, the thing that I'm hesitant to say about things that I overly don't like is that I might not like it, but you might. And then who am I to say that this is not a good beer? You know, and who are any of us to say that it's not a good beer? If, if somebody likes the taste of it, that's a personal preference. You know, I, I'm sure as we did this tasting today that you noticed that some of you really liked it. Maybe your neighbor sitting next to you is like, oh, that's not for me. You know, I saw people passing off their glasses. And there's no shame in that. And, there, you know, beer is a very personal experience. Um, brewers are trying weird stuff these days. Um, but it's from the weird stuff that you sometimes get the best stuff. And it's that continually pushing of the innovation. It's that continually pushing of um, you know, brewers going and finding uh, you know, weird ingredients. Uh, uh, oyster stouts have been around for a really long time. And oysters and stouts are a wonderful beer and food pairing. And so putting oysters into your stout um, really brings out this sort of like savoriness in the beer along with some of that sweetness and adds a little bit of body and depth to it. Um, I love oyster stouts, but 
if there's people in here who are squeamish at the idea of oysters uh, or you know eating you know raw shellfish, um, you're, you're not going to like that. And so it's tough to say ingredients that I don't personally like. There's some people who are tea drinkers and not coffee drinkers who are just turned off by my whole little spiel on coffee. So it, 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 it's a tough thing to really say these days. It's judge each beer um, yourself, and if you like it, drink more of it. And if you don't, you're going to find something that, that you will like. Questions? Oh. You guys can duke it out there. Is there any more of this um, uh, almanac? Somewhere? Sorry, I just need to reload and I'm not I'm not joking. I got off of a plane like three hours ago from New Zealand. Um, I've been up for like twenty four hours and I still have to fly back to Jersey tonight, so this is my seatmate is gonna hate me on the plane. Yes. Yeah, I'd love to hear uh, kind of a two-part question. First question is how uh, your opinion of California breweries versus breweries from other states. And then uh, part two, or what are three beers we have to try before we die? Uh, good questions. Um, California has the most breweries out of any state in the union right now. So by nature of that, you have a really big, diverse beer culture. Um, San Diego uh, is, is, is a hop capital. Right now, uh, they're doing these really big, dank, uh, super hoppy, super aggressive beers. Um, and you're seeing some of those in other parts of the state as well. Uh, hops, hops come into big play in California, um, whereas other states use them, but maybe not in the same way that California does. Uh, if you say to somebody a San Diego or a, a West Coast style IPA, chances are that they're thinking of California, specifically San Diego. Uh, but then you go up to Berkeley and San Francisco and that general area where this beer comes from, and they're doing a lot of barrel aging because they're in wine country or close to wine country, and there's access to barrels, and they're really interested in those flavors, and they're interested in using, you know, like with this beer, that, that, that wild sourdough uh, to, to help culture the beer. Um, so it, it's a really diverse beer state, uh, and it's, it, 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 I mean, it, it's a great beer state, um, no doubt. Uh, three beers that you have to try. That's a really tough one. Um, you know, because it, when, when you talk about, you know, is it, is it the global beer scene? Is it the U.S. beer scene? Is it your local beer scene? Um, I think that there's a couple of beers that have shaped the U.S. right now. Um, Sierra Nevada Pale Ale, I think everybody should taste. Uh, I think that that's a great beer, that it has... A, um, a great hop characteristic to it, but it also has a great malt characteristic to it. It's a very, very well-balanced beer. Uh, it's a very easy drinking beer, and it's found everywhere these days. And it can be easy to forget that when it first came out, that it was revolutionary in a lot of ways. Uh, so many, you know, if, if Ken Grossman was inspired by Jack McAuliffe, a, a, a whole new generations of brewers were originally inspired by Sierra Nevada and that particular beer. So that's a fun beer. Uh, to pay attention to. Um, man, I'm really trying to think of, I already mentioned raspberry tart from New Glarus, which is, for me, one of those ones that everybody should try. And they have an interesting business model that they're doing more than 100,000 barrels of beer a year, and they're just staying in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, they're choosing to stay local, um, which is incredible uh, when you think about how people are just shipping their beer around the country and around the world. Um, Will Myers makes that awesome archivist from uh, Cambridge, but you can only get it uh, if you're at his pub in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So that's a, that's a tough thing to say. Um, you do have an office in Cambridge? Road trip. Let's go. Uh, next summer, we're all going to meet at Cambridge Brewing, and we're all going to drink the archivist. Um, yeah, I mean, those, th those kind of jump out in my mind. But again, it's, I've had so many good beers. I've had these wonderful bourbon barrel-aged uh, beers. Full Sail Brewing Company does a bourbon barrel aged imperial stout uh, every year that has these really wonderful boozy vanilla woody notes to them as well um, with the stout. And a lot of people are doing bourbon barrel aged these days. And if you love bourbon and you love uh, beer, it's just a, a perfect marriage between the two if it's done right. Um, you know, there's some really wonderful, you know, Belgian quads if you're really into, you know, deep stone fruity, boozy. Um, uh, you know, foreign styles of beers. There's something beautiful about just a normal Kolsch 
a very simple, uh, you know, German German Kolsch that is refreshing and light. And so, you know, must try try them all. You know, try you know, follow your palate. I, I mean, that's really it. Is just you know, who am I to, to to sit up here? I mean, except you know that I was invited to, um, to say you know, try these beers. Follow your palate. Follow your passion. Follow where your your taste buds move you. Because again, um, it's 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 subjective. Whatever I say, you know, I could say, oh, this is a must try before you die, and you could drink it. God, it's awful. He doesn't know what the hell he's talking about. Uh, personal palates are different. So yeah. Do you have a question? Yeah. So you were talking about some of the reasons why why people say they don't like beer. Yes. And one that I hear in LA a lot is, you know, it's too many carbs, it's too it's too heavy, blah blah blah. Um, do you see the anything in the craft beer industry trying to tackle that or a, approach that or market that or so um, I'm not in the best of physical conditions as a beer drinker. Um, and, I, you know, it, so it's tough for me to talk about the caloric intake. But here's the thing. Um, a lot of people will cite that beer is bad for you or worse for you than wine or spirits and that kind of thing. It's really not. Uh, it's comparable uh, to, to some of those sometimes. But um, it's everything in moderation, really. If you're going to drink three six packs a night or you know three six packs a week and then not work out and all that well yeah it's going to be bad for you you know but you know I, I've been out traveling where you know I've seen people you know just kill a bottle of wine themselves and you know like that's not better for you it's not much cause um, what we've seen though is there's a lot of the the larger beer companies that market to a lower calorie uh, intake so Ones that say, oh, we only have 65 calories or we only have 100 calories and things like that. 64, I know, I wasn't trying to like, I'm getting like corrected in the back. It's 60, it's Miller 64. I was trying to give them a pass on this one. I was trying to give them a pass, you know, of uh, just throwing out an arbitrary number than, you know, a, a, a watered down beer. Um, but, you know, a, a, a Guinness, for example, uh, they had a big advertising campaign a couple years ago, uh, has about 125 calories in it. Right? People would think that it has a lot more. Uh, you know, your normal beers are somewhere in the 100 to 200 calorie range. Um, it's not that bad for you considering everything else that we might eat during the day. It's just that perception that beer makes you bloated or beer makes you fat or you get a beer belly or, you know, all, all, all those manners of things that wine has done a very good job and spirits have done a very good job of sort of, you know, playing up the sophistication and the health aspect or, or the higher uh, aspect um, uh, range of it, so yeah, it, it's not it's it's not necessarily bad for you. It's just everything in moderation. Right. So my question was more. Yes. Uh, do you see something? Because I agree with you. I love you. And yeah. I, I don't think it's that. But the, there's that perception out there. Whether you see something in the marketing, or if, if that's something that's trying to be attacked head on, or if it's just. Conversations like these are saying, yeah. It's, it's, not, it's not being attacked head on in the way that I would like the industry to attack it head on. Uh, I, I think that if we put, if we started putting caloric intakes on there, I think it could help or hurt because you're going to get some beers uh, that are going to have 600 calories in them just given by the nature of the sugar. And they're not going to want to put that on there. Um, and if one brewery makes a, a beer that has 100 calories and one brewery, and the same brewery makes one that has 600, it's you know, do you do a blanket or not? And then you're going to get accused of false advertising. So I think it's a slippery slope for a lot of them. Um, every couple of years uh, that, you know, uh, eat this, not that, drink this, not that book comes back into vogue. And uh, invariably they show up on the Today Show and it's, you know, have this beer that's like water and not this barley wine that has 600 calories. You can't even compare the two beers. And it's like, if I'm going to drink this barley wine, that means I'm only going to have one. And it means that I'm not, you know, then rather than drinking six of those, which would actually equal one of these. And that's, that's something that we need to change. But, I, you know, that's a question for the individual brewers. There's not an easy answer, unfortunately, for that at this point. Um, you know, the other thing, um, you know, just perception-wise, uh, we were talking about calories. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to point out just really quickly as you look at the bottles up there uh, that we had today, uh, you'll see a lot of the, the famous uh, brown glass 12-ounce bottles, but you also see the larger 22-ounce uh, uh, bottle, uh, the IPA, 
And then that really cool looking bottle that we have with this uh, blonde that we're drinking right now. And then there's also the can, which I always love pouring cans because people think that can is a lesser vessel. It's really not. Uh, it keeps out light. It's easier to ship. Uh, keeping out light helps the beer from getting that skunk flavor or that oxidation flavor uh, as well. Uh, it's lighter, so it ships easier. It's stackable. Um, it, it, you can take it camping. You can take it to the poolside. You can take it to the shore uh, without worrying about uh, broken glass. So um, don't dismiss beers in cans. Uh, I, I hope you all like that flavorful beer. That we, You can crush it on your head after, after you're done drinking it if, uh, if you're really into it and if you've had a couple. Um, so yeah, don't dismiss a beer in a can because I, I, I'm sure as you were drinking it, uh, you didn't notice any off flavors and you hopefully enjoyed that beer uh, and that came from a can. So don't dismiss it um, when you see it. So thanks so much, guys. This was really cool for me to be here. Um, it's, it's, a, it, it's a company that I've long admired from afar. So to sit here with you guys and be able to talk about the thing that I love and the place where you guys work and love uh, has been a really cool experience uh, for me. And I hope that you enjoy the book and your beer and food tasting journey. I hope to come back and do a beer dinner with you guys at some point. So cheers. Thanks so much. <laughs>